Hi, everyone. As we wait for some people to come in, I'm just going to go ahead and get us kick started since we have a lot of really great information and wonderful speakers to hear from today. So good afternoon and welcome to our Leaders of the PAC speaker series. My name is Anna Valeggia and I am the Director of Career Services for the NC State Alumni Association. We are so excited to have an excellent lineup of speakers and are thankful for all of you who had decided to spend the next hour of your day with us. So just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Everyone is on mute and your video functionality has been turned off. The session is being recorded and we will be made available by email to all registrants before close of business tomorrow. And I want to quickly go over the layout of the event just so you kind of know how it works. So we have asked each distinguished alumni who you see uh, their wonderful headshots featured. Um, each of them will answer the following three questions. So question one, how did you enter the workforce and migrate to where you are now? So we will hear from each speaker individually for this question. Question number two are what three factors led to your success? And question number three, what advice would you give your 20 something self or a different way to phrase it, what advice would you give yourself when you were first starting your career knowing what you know now? So for questions two and three, we will be doing this as a panel discussion and then we'll open it up for other questions after that. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our distinguished alumni speaker. So I'm actually gonna let each of them introduce themselves as they answer question one. So we are going to start with Eric Wong. Eric, thank you so much for being here and you can take it away. Let me go ahead and get your video started. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eric Kwong and I'm the founder and CEO of Prometheus. Um, so I just wanted to describe uh, how I got here. Um, Great. Okay, great. Just a high level summary. Uh, basically, I'm an engineering major that ended up running a software company. Uh, the company is called Prometheus Group. It was founded in 1998. It's headquartered in Raleigh. We have about 500 employees across the globe. Uh, this year, we're probably going to pull in about $150 million in revenue. Uh, our software is critical for all the top heavy asset companies uh, in the world. So that's Prometheus Group and how did I get here? So basically, um, I probably started my career just like everybody else in here. Uh, in high school, was really good at math and science, but had no idea of what I wanted to do. Um, so I talked to um, my guidance counselor and she said, okay, hey, good at math and science, obviously you're going to be an engineer. So I decided to go to NC State, decided to go into Chem E because that had the highest starting salary at that time. Uh, once I was getting close to graduation, I still didn't uh, know what I wanted to do. So probably like few of you in here decided to go to grad school. Um, grad school, was probably where I uh, learned my first life lesson, which is, hey, you can actually be successful at something that you don't love, but it really takes so much more effort than your competitors or in grad school, uh, your colleagues. So about two and a half years into it, I decided to drop out. Oops. So, this is how I ended up at Accenture. So Accenture is really my first and only real job. Uh, it's a great company with super talented people. Um, they really sold me on this concept of meritocracy, which is, hey, the best rise to the top. So this one was, it doesn't matter how long you've been with the company, as long as you do a great job, deliver results, you're going to move up faster than everybody else. So really loved it totally bought into it for about uh, six months. After six months, I sort of became disillusioned. And I said, oh, I feel like I'm doing the best work. But Accenture is such a large company. It's so easy to just get lost in the bureaucracy. 
So that's when I decided to go start my own company. So this is the beginnings of Prometheus Group. Uh, basically, what I wanted to do was cut out the middleman, turn myself into a one-man consulting shop. And the benefits of that was, hey, uh, Accenture takes a big cut of your potential earnings. So by just going out on my own, I was able to triple my Accenture salary. And this is the 90s version of a gig worker. So if you think about contractors or things nowadays like Upwork, this is the 90s version of that. Um, surviving at this level, you know, you just had to have a valuable skill set. For me, it was uh, programming and SAP. You had to be able to work hard. And then more importantly, you had to have a big tolerance for risk and unfair situations. Because you're by yourself, you didn't have a large company providing a safety net for you. Um, so I did that for about five years. Um, and what I saw was that, hey, everybody in my field was trying to solve the same problem. Uh, and there, everybody was doing it as a consulting gig. Um, so I decided to pivot and turn Prometheus Group into a software shop um, and say, hey, everybody um, just needs the same solution. And instead of rebuilding it over and over again, I'm just going to build it once and sell it over and over again. So surviving at this level is where I really needed to learn what I call non-engineering traits. So I think engineers are really just taught to solve the problem right in front of them. Here, we, I had to become more strategic. Um, the other thing was, you know, good at math and science programming, it's really just easy to get lost in the code. Um, if you're that way, you can sort of set yourself up for failure. So you had to focus on being a well-rounded person, which for me was understanding business situations, understanding negotiations. Um, finally, you know, realistic versus idealistic, and then assuming responsibility for everything. So it's really looking out for the person beside you. Um, so that's basically uh, how I started from an engineering major or even in high school to running a software company. Uh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, that's it. <laughs> thank you so much, Eric. That was really interesting. We really appreciate you sharing your story. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. So next up, we're actually going to hear from Dr. Linda Butler. So I'm going to go ahead and get her set up. All right. Take it away, Linda. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I am Linda Butler. I am the Vice President of Medical Affairs and Chief Medical Officer at UNC Rex Healthcare um, here in Raleigh. Um, I have pretty much the same start to my story as Eric had. Uh, when I was in high school, I enjoyed math and science. And in particular, I enjoyed physics. I chose my major by process of elimination. I went through all the engineering disciplines and crossed out everything that didn't sound like it was that interesting and ended up in nuclear engineering. Uh, during my four years at uh, NC State, my father had a couple of um, very serious medical procedures and health issues, and, and that's where I was a little bit more exposed to medicine. I was not one of these uh, physicians who have lots of family members who were docs and wanted to be a physician all through uh, their academic life. Uh, it was just it kind of came to me on my freshman or sophomore year. So I, I said, yeah, this body fluids are not that bad. I think I can maybe pursue a career in medicine, but finished off my nuclear engineering degree because that's a good fallback uh, a career to have if you don't get into med school. And uh, I did get in right when I finished undergrad, but um, had decided that I better make sure that if I'm gonna invest another four years uh, in, in school that I really do wanna do this. And I ended up doing a master's in medical physics. And it was the perfect combination of engineering and medicine to see which part I really wanted to spend my time uh, working in. And I liked the medicine side better. So I ended up 
going to UNC with the goal of either being a radiologist or a radiation oncologist because I didn't want to kind of waste my, my last four years of undergrad. And then when I got closer and closer to uh, having to choose a residency path, I realized that what I really enjoyed about medicine was the interaction with people. And if I did radiation oncology or radiology, I could have just stayed in engineering. I'd be spending time in front of a computer, except I'd be in the dark in front of a computer. And so I ended up doing pediatrics. And I chose pediatrics for a couple of reasons. One, uh, growing up, I had always wanted to be a teacher uh, and you know, decided that I, you know, I didn't have enough of a challenge being a teacher and that's where I went into engineering. And then also because I found that children, um, they recover really well despite what we do to them in medicine and parents will do absolutely anything for their kids. Uh, they'll choose their children over themselves. And so I, I really enjoyed the pediatric uh, world and was in private practice for 14 years. I had a wonderful group, wonderful um, partners, enjoyed my patients. And as part of your obligation when you're on medical staff, you start sitting in, in various committees and I was um, tagged to, to start chairing committees and eventually I was elected as president of the medical staff here at Rex. And at the time the hospital was really growing and we had a new president and he said, you know, we really need a chief medical officer at Rex. And so as part of the medical executive committee, we helped determine a job description and uh, kind of got the medical staff buy-in that yes, we need this, um, you know, administrative liaison between the medical staff and, and the hospital uh, administration. And I ended up saying, okay, here's, here's a job description, you know, happy to help interview. And he goes, well, you know, really, you're doing a lot of this work now as president of the medical staff, you should apply for the job. So I had not given hospital administration a single thought until that moment and talked it over with, with my family. I thought, you know what, I'll apply. If I don't get it, totally fine and happy being a practicing pediatrician. And then uh, I was offered the job and that was 11 years ago and I am still here. The hospital has changed, healthcare has changed. Um, there's a lot more uh, government regulation um, and my job at Rex has changed a lot over the last 11 years from being the chief medical officer, um, implementing EPIC, to running a performance improvement department, to helping with case management across the whole UNC healthcare system. The irony in all this is now I spend a lot of my day in front of a computer. So what I was probably trying to avoid early in my career, I'm back doing it now. So um, that's kind of everything in a nutshell. That's funny with the irony, but <laughs> it sounds like it's a really great, great position. So thank you so much, Linda. Um, and just to remind everybody, we are answering the question, how did you enter the workforce and migrate to where you are now? So thank you, Linda. We are next going to hear from Tony Blevins. One second. All right, Tony, take it away. Okay. Uh, good, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is um, Tony Blevins. As you might tell right away from the accent, I happen to be a uh, proud native North Carolinian. However, today I'm calling in from a little town called Half Moon Bay along the uh, California coastline, about 20 miles south of uh, San Francisco and 20 miles north of, of Silicon Valley. That uh, It's my pleasure to be here today, and um, I was really um, moved by the words that, uh, that Eric said, that he and I have some... Um, very similar parallels, and we've never met before before this call. But to give you a, an idea of uh, very briefly of my matriculation, that um, you know, as a teenager, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do, but uh, I was pretty good at math, and so um, I wound up getting a perfect score SAT math. And so a high school counselor told me that I must be an engineer, and so it was decided at that point. And so similar to Eric being an NC State fan growing up in, in North Carolina, that uh, I looked through the engineering disciplines and at the time I was entering, uh, Kimmy wasn't the highest paying um, engineering discipline. It was a near tie be uh, between petroleum engineering 
and uh, industrial engineering. And looking at the two, I had very broad interest. And so that's about the amount of depth that I put into choosing industrial engineering. Uh, but once I got to NC State, I found I absolutely loved it. I loved the fact that it touched on so many of the engineering disciplines because my interests were quite broad then and they're actually uh, quite broad now. I don't like to be too pigeonholed into any one particular thing. So while I was at um, NC State, I did want to learn more about the, the practical aspects of, of engineering, not just academics. And so that led me to join the co-op program. And so I worked at IBM uh, Boca Raton as both a junior and senior and absolutely loved it. And that um, led me to join IBM Research Triangle Park. Um, and at IBM, um, I had an opportunity to work in a number of different disciplines and I, I took advantage of, of those opportunities um, and also expanded geographically. So I wound up going from uh, Research Triangle Park to uh, back to Boca Raton. I did assignments in um, Seoul, Korea, Tokyo, Japan, and my last position there was uh, lab director of IBM Scotland. But at some point during that uh, matriculation, because uh, I was supposed to be gaining uh, broad-based skills, that I was asked to do an assignment at headquarters in New York of where my mentor would be a, a gentleman by the name of Gene Richter, who at that time was chief procurement officer of, um, of IBM. And that was a discipline I didn't know anything about, but I was um, obviously there for a year to learn, which I did. And he was a, a very generous mentor and I learned a lot and found that I actually liked the, the discipline. And so from there, after about 12 years at IBM, I was given the opportunity to join Apple, which uh, at that point in time, uh, many of you may not recall because we're going back a, a few years, um, it was a less obvious choice than it might be today. That I can recall at the time I joined Apple, I was already with a good company, IBM, who had a market cap over 20 times the size of Apple. So in other words, Apple was 5% the size of IBM and losing money quarter on quarter. And there was a lot of speculation the company was headed toward um, imminent bankruptcy. But what attracted me was the, the passion, the focus on products, the people. There was an energy in Silicon Valley that I just hadn't experienced in Raleigh or elsewhere for that matter. And so I rolled the dice and decided to, um, to come out to Silicon Valley. And so I've been very poor, uh, fortunate to work with some really terrific people, work on some really terrific products, and things have, have kind of worked out. And so it's interesting to me today that during this call, I just checked uh, the respective market caps of IBM and Apple, and now Apple is 20 times the size of IBM. And so it's something obviously I would have never predicted no one else would have either. But I think we'll get to some questions along this, um, this line earlier. But I think if you follow your passion, good things tend to, to work out. And, um, and so far, it has worked out for me. Thank you. Yeah, I think rolling the dice worked out, Tony. <laughs> that, was, so. that was really interesting. Thank you so much. So last but certainly, nice, la certainly not least is Rashida Hodge. So she actually is currently at IBM. So it'll be nice to kind of hear a little bit of contrast there. So let me go ahead and get her up and run in here. Thank you so much. How do I follow Tony with that market <laughs> cap? Oh, give me some of that money. <laughs> so Rashida Hodge, Vice President of um, IBM Global Markets area. Um, like everyone has said on the panel, um, great in math and science, which led me to engineering, which led me to NC State, and then I decided to become an industrial engineer. In terms of officially how I started the workforce, I actually started the workforce as an intern. So when I was at NC State, I interned from my freshman year, and actually many people would say, you're never going to get an internship as a freshman, but you know I did, and I actually pursued an internship every single summer. Um, in different areas at different companies. And when I would come back in the fall, I would actually share what I learned with my classmates and probe about their intern experiences and all that good stuff. And at the end of my senior year, a classmate of mine, Damon Butler, he came back excited and shared with me his experiences at this company called IBM. And I said, IBM hires industrial engineers, really? And he was like, absolutely, they do, hundreds of them. And I said, okay, well, I had absolutely no clue. So he said, look, he said, give me your resume. They're looking for more people. He's like, you need to take them seriously and get on board. So 
I reluctantly provided my resume. And after six months and after actually starting my master's in industrial engineering, IBM finally called me back. <laughs> and so they convinced me that, you know, I should give them a shot and they would actually give me flexibility to work while I was still getting my master's at state. So it sounded like a pretty good deal and I was bought in. It was certainly more than flipping burgers. <laughs> and I could set my own schedule, so why not? And I, I took the opportunity to start working with them in RTP. When I finished my master's, I actually interviewed at every company under the sun. So even though I was still working at IBM um, as an intern part-time, I really took an opportunity to you know, see, explore and have curiosity of what was out there. But IBM actually differentiated itself from while I was working part-time, I found out about a rotational leadership program that was targeted to MBA graduates. And I went to my intern manager and I said, look, I don't have an MBA, but I've got a master's in industrial engineering from NC State. So I can compete with any recent MBA grad. So how do I apply? And so long story short, I was given the opportunity to compete and I landed the job. I was actually the first candidate accepted into that program without an MBA. And interestingly enough, a couple years later, IBM actually altered the program to recruit students who specifically had advanced engineering degrees. So there was a lesson there for me that basically said, closed mouths don't get fed. So ask for what you want. The worst answer you can get is, is no. And so I finished up this leadership program and it really helped me to accelerate my path within the company because it exposed me to many different areas and verticals and functions. And I finished up this program after two years and I was immediately promoted to a management role, which really began my executive career within the company. And when I was an intern, I actually spent a lot of time trying to figure out what I want to be, where I want to be in IBM. So after finishing up the program and getting promoted as a manager, I actually did what I called working my career backwards. So I looked at where I wanted to be in 20 years and I started asking and taking on roles that would allow me to be competitive for that role in 20 years. So as an example, I started out my career in the hardware operational side of the business, but when I looked at members of our C-suite at that time, there was one person who came from the operational side of the business. So what did that tell me? I needed to go do something else. So I made a pivot and I made a pivot to our software part of the business, which was you know, growing, we we're doing a lot of mergers and acquisitions, and it actually opened up an opportunity for me to be part of launching our artificial intelligence commercial business. So it's now been 18 years into that journey. I've had 13 jobs, completed two international assignments, one in China, one in Slovakia. I've traveled, worked with clients and led teams in more than 60 countries. So it's been a roller coaster, but a roller coaster that has been well worth it, but it required me to take some risks, put myself out there, and most importantly, make a plan and look at that plan in the future. So I'm happy with the result thus far and I'm not even done yet. Wonderful, thank you so much for sharing Rashida. So what I'm gonna do now is just ask that all of the um, speakers join me. So we're gonna get them all here and then we're gonna move on to the next questions. We're just going to get Eric's video starting and then we'll, we'll get going. Um, and just to let everyone know, if you do have some questions, feel free to submit those through the Q&A function. Um, we'd be happy to answer those. We do have a lot of questions that came through from the registration form. So once we get through our next two questions, we'll get started on those. But if you do have anything that comes up, please feel free to submit those through the Q&A. All right, so we're going to go on to question number two. 
what three factors led to your success? So Rashid, I felt like you were on a roll. So do you want to take the, take the first stab at this one? Yeah, sure. For me, I would say the ability to have a vision, but plan for that vision and then make sure that everyone is aware of that vision. So as I was mentioning, when I joined IBM, I knew I wanted to be a senior executive in the company and be in the C-suite but I didn't particularly know exactly what function or role, um, but I knew that I wanted to be able to make an impact that was meaningful and game changing. So I researched people who were in those jobs that I could see myself in. I checked out their backgrounds. I analyzed their career moves they made. And in many cases, I even cold called them. I reached out to them and I said, I wanna be in your spot one day and can you give me some advice? And in every single case, they took my call, right? Or answered my email and they were actually being very open in terms of willing to share. So you might think that, okay, that's really strange, right? This new hire is picking up the phone, randomly calling people. Why don't you go do your job? Well, I did my job as well, but those conversations were very beneficial because it provided me with insight on their journey. And it also allowed me to have a real perspective on a roadmap for my journey. And most importantly, it, it made sure that other people knew my goals and ambitions, because I believe the more people know your goals and ambitions, the more people will actually help you get there. I love that. And ask for what you want, right? I mean, if you're going to get a no if you don't ask anyways. So I think that is really, really good advice. Thank you so much. So um, Tony, we're going to go to you next for question number two. What three factors led to your success? Um, if I were to limit it to three factors, I would say probably um, empathy, passion, and mistakes. And by empathy, what I mean is, it's what I've learned over the years, that all of us work in either small or large groups of people. That's a necessity in most careers. And I think the ability to view a situation, not from your own perspective, but the other person's perspective, and developing ideas and proposals um, that have a better opportunity of, of getting buy-in, I think is very important. And then going forward, you'll find that if you can surround yourself by similar people who also look at your perspective, then you have small teams of people who can really accomplish amazing things. And so empathy, I think, is number one. Secondly, and perhaps more important than that, is passion. And Eric mentioned that earlier, and as I said earlier, that we had many parallels, that the most important thing is passion about what you're doing. And it took me some period of time to, to learn that. But something that you're really passionate about, I think you've got a much greater opportunity of being uh, successful at it. But even if you might not be a success by some metrics, if it's something you're passionate about and you enjoy, then by definition, you are a success is the way um, I look at it. And then the third item, which might be more important than either of the other two, and it, it might not be um, intuitive, is mistakes, the concept of mistakes. That what I've learned in Silicon Valley, that if you're not making mistakes, then you're not pushing hard enough. If you're not moving outside your comfort zone, if you're not trying something new, if you're not trying to innovate, then you're not reaching your full potential. And if you are pushing the envelope hard enough, you will inevitably make mistakes. But I think what's important from uh, in that is that you have to learn from those mistakes. As someone who continually makes the same mistakes, that's a different story, but you have to learn from those mistakes. And more importantly, um, you have to learn from the mistakes of others. I've noticed people who are very observant and they don't have to necessarily make every mistake on their own and experience that pain, but they look at what others are doing and they learn from those mistakes. I think that's very important. And it reminds me of a, a little league baseball coach I had who told me something that I've never forgotten. <clears throat> we were actually in the state championship game. We had done pretty well. It was a one to nothing game. We had not had a base runner the entire game. I wound up getting a hit and was on first base with two outs and he gave me the steal signal to steal second. And so I was planning on taking second and was very aggressive about it, except the pitcher noticed that turned and picked me off. And, uh, you know, I was very disappointed. I'd lost the game and he put his arm around me and told me something I'll never forget, which is you cannot steal second base with one foot on first. That your assignment was to steal second. You were very aggressive about it. It, it didn't work out, but you can't steal second with one foot on first. I've never forgotten that. That is great advice. And I, I love what you said about mistakes too. And I feel like Eric was really nodding along and I know he had mentioned something about mistakes too. So Eric, do you want to take the second question? 
Oh uh, yeah, the the reason I was nodding is I think I'm going to be the Grinch of the group. So so I think uh, the three factors that I think are huge for me are, um, hey, to really succeed, and this is maybe from an entrepreneurial point of view, is you have to work hard. So there isn't a such thing as a work-life balance. Um, you, all your competitors are similarly skilled. They have similar resources. So you just have to go hard. That's where you differentiate yourself. Um, you know, one thing that Rashida mentioned was just having the end goal in mind. That's exactly what we did at Prometheus Group. And we set small milestones, which was, our first goal was, okay, how do we have a million dollars in revenue? How do we get to $10 million in revenue? Oh, okay, once we get to $10 million in revenue, people say, hey, that's a good business but you're not taking seriously until you get to 20 million in revenue. Oh, once you achieve that goal, they'll say, hey, Eric, that's great. But now if you get hit by a bus, your company's worth nothing. You don't have any infrastructure. So you're constantly challenging yourself to work hard, to pick up new skills. Um, so what Rashida said was exactly spot on. Okay, this is probably where I go a little bit dark. Um, but I mean this in the nicest way possible, which is your teammates and your competitors are fine with losing as long as it's not their fault. So anything that you're doing that is difficult, you'll see that you really have to work hard. You have to have a lot of passion because as soon as it gets tough, people are starting to go, okay, I might not make it. What excuses can I look for? What are the things that uh, allow me to fail, but it not be my fault? So, you know, just growing this business, it, it's kind of funny because um, Tony mentioned this and I was like, oh, okay. Uh, we're one fiftieth the size of IBM. So I think that means one one thousandth the size of uh, Apple. But, um, you know, what we saw is like, as soon as the going gets tough, people start looking to bail out. Um, so as long as you're one of the few people that can power through that, you have an edge. The uh, last thing is every once in a while, you will get stuck in a no-win situation. And so when you're in that situation, you're really trying to say, okay, I can't get everything but what's the most important thing? And so you reduce the scope of the problem and say, okay, hey, this is a no win. Change the rules of the game. Focus on what's truly important and go after that. So those are my three things. Wonderful, thank you so much. All right, Linda, what three factors led to your success? Well, I probably have a combination of the three that everybody else has. Uh, I probably would put work ethic first. Any mornings, my car is the first one in the parking deck, and there's times when I get ready to leave, and my car is the last car on that level where I'll go C Street and take it to the park. Uh, but I really enjoy what I do, so I don't see it as a hardship. Um, you know, I don't wake up and dread going to work every morning. Um, I look forward to the day and what the day has to bring. I was not as strategic um, as, as uh, Rashida was about reaching out to people because of where I wanted to be. I was actually pretty fortunate that other people saw talents in myself that I might not have recognized and provided opportunities. And so as you get handed more projects, more responsibility, and you succeed and you do them well, then you have other opportunities that are, are given to you. Um, so I, I think I credit my, my second uh, piece of advice is don't say no. If somebody asks you to do something, and even if it takes you out of your comfort zone, go ahead and do it. And I would say as a chief medical officer, I have a very um, non-traditional set of responsibilities. I'm much more operational, and I think it's probably because of my engineering background because most chief medical officers just have the medical staff, but I have you know, infection prevention, case management, performance improvement, 
uh, all of the regulatory pieces and then quality. So I, I have more um, diversity underneath me than what most chief medical officers do. And then that leads me to kind of my third, um, you know, third factor is I'm not afraid to speak up. And sometimes it's speaking up and saying what is unpopular and uh, advocating for, you know, putting the patient first or uh, advocating for your coworkers during a COVID crisis to make sure that they have everything they need to safely take care of patients. So just speaking up and making sure that you are looking out for the well-being of everybody. And uh, you know, sometimes people will joke, oh yeah, well, Linda will make us do the right thing. And uh, you know, kind of you need to know that there's gonna be somebody who's ethical and has integrity and will stand up to make sure that everybody does the right thing. So those are my three, work ethic, don't say no, and don't be afraid to speak up. Those are wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to question number three. So again, if y'all have any questions, feel free to put those in the Q&A. So question number three, we've um, phrased in two different ways. So just answer the one that kind of resonates with you a little bit more. So that would be, what advice would you give your 20-something self? Or what advice would you give yourself when you first started in your career knowing what you know now? So Tony, we'll get started with you. Um, looking back, and it wasn't apparent to me at the time, but I would have been better at seeking out breadth of opportunities. That as someone very young entering the workforce, knowing now that you probably have a, a long career, you don't want to limit yourself too soon. That I think you want the broadest set of possibilities and opportunities uh, that could be available to you. And from there, it comes down to making judicious choices about which of those opportunities to pursue and you pursue the ones that resonate in your heart as much as they do in your head. But I think you've got to get all the opportunities out there and then just um, follow your heart in pursuit of them. That's great. And follow your passion, right? Like you were saying earlier. Yeah. That's yeah. Really important. All right, Rashida, what about you? So, well, first of all, I'm still in my 20s. Come on. But uh, <laughs> I would say, um, you know, one, live in the moment. Um, you know, I felt like I was super determined and focused on my goals. And, you know, over time, I realized that it's less about the destination and more about the journey. And you should really enjoy those moments along the way. And, you know, don't feel like you have to give up the moment to get ahead. And I think I did a lot of that. I gave up a lot of those moments and smelling the roses as I was trying to get to that destination. And I think the second thing is, you know, your personal health wellness and self goals are just as important. I mean, I remember working until 2 a.m. in the morning, waking up at 6 a.m. and starting all over, or even worse, I used to hook up my computer to speakers so I can hear the IBM chat sound off when my team in Asia would ping me um, or to remind me from my crazy late night calls. I mean, it sounds insane, but I did that for a really long time and it was insane. Um, but, you know, after going to the doctor one day and my doctor telling me, look, you're on the verge of being pre-diabetic, you better take care of yourself. That was my wake up call. Right. And that's when I began to, you know, I think like to Eric's point, right. There's no like work life and personal life. It's all integrated and they're all really important and they're all different balls with different shapes and sizes. And, but your health is a ball that when it falls, it doesn't just bounce back. So you have to take care of it. And so for me taking that seriously, um, you know, I actually feel like I've become a much better leader um, now. Wonderful, thank you. You mentioned health, you mentioned work ethics. I'm gonna go over to Dr. Linda Butler for, for your advice. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, it's a lot easier to give advice than to follow it, right? Um, so uh, actually, my answer is very much like Rashida's. Um, and I'll kind of say in two parts. One, you know, when you're in, in school or you're early on in your career, you're more fo focused on getting the grade than actually learning what you need to learn um, to apply later on. And I was very driven. And um, you know, before I would, I would get a goal, I'd achieve a goal, and rather than celebrate
about smelling the roses, living in the, the moment. Um, so I think that is one of the one of the pieces of advice I would give is please, you know, celebrate your successes as you achieve them. Uh, I think the other thing on your health is uh, everybody needs to know what their own set point is and, you know, what you trade off if you are, you know, working too long, not getting enough sleep, uh, your health will suffer. Um, but I'm probably the wrong person to give you that advice because I do get up every morning at 4.30 and even when I'm on vacation, I'm getting calls from the hospital and my family has just come to accept that. Um, they do limit my hours when I'm, I'm off, but yes, you can only check email between the hours of 10 and 12 in the morning and that's it. So uh, it is um, making sure that you do have a better balance between work and life and one that works for you. I mean, different people will have different set points. And that's a perfect segue because I know Eric, you mentioned the, the work-life balance if that actually was a thing. So what is, what is your advice, Eric? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, I, I think um, I'm going to be the Grinch again, but I'm going to echo like Tony, Rashida, uh, like what they said is exactly right. You know, my take is opportunities are always coming and going. So everybody that's successful, they always chalk it up to luck. Um, I don't actually believe that's true. I think that people that are successful are better at seeing opportunities as they come by and taking advantage of it. Like if you talk about, if you just go back to Rashida and how she's planned her career or how Tony took a big risk and, you know, went to uh, Apple when it was a 20th the size of IBM. That's spotting an opportunity and taking advantage of it. So opportunities are never ever neatly packaged and go, hey, you know, I'm an opportunity. This is a perfect one. There is no downside whatsoever. So you have to go, oh, this is an opportunity, but it's ugly and it's going to take some work to, to accomplish my goals. Uh, most people will just say, uh, it, it's not perfect enough this isn't the right time. Um, and I think everybody on the panel said, no, the opportunity has come. It might not be convenient, but I have to take it now. Um, so I think that's what I would say. Uh, I think one of the stories that I had was uh, Prometheus Group. I actually started that with three of my friends. So Prometheus is worth a lot now. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, but, uh, you know, it was four of us that started the company. Three of them didn't even last three months. You know, it's either softball practice. One of them decided to go get an MBA. Uh, another one, uh, there was this TV show, this is way back when, called Dallas. It was like a late night uh, or evening soap opera. Uh, he wanted to watch that more. So this is an opportunity where, hey, those guys are doing okay like their uh, regular jobs, but they had a chance to be really just spectacular. Sounds like they did not roll the dice like Tony did. Exactly. <laughs> and they, well, hey, now they have probably more time to watch some Dallas. So there you go. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. So um, well, we'll, we'll let, if there are any questions that anyone wants to ask, we'll let those come through. But I want to go ahead and get to some of the questions that were asked on the registration form because I thought some of them were really great and would love to hear some of your insights. So um, this question I thought was really interesting. So I'm just going to so you're just going to read it to you. So after working for three years, it's become clear to me that having a great career requires one to continuously not just stay aware of the new and upcoming needs of the industry one works in, but also adapt. So what do you do on a regular basis to learn more about your industries and how do you adapt to any changes? You can give any experience or examples of that. I'd be really interested. So whoever wants to jump in. I mean, I can share uh, in healthcare, it, the only constant is change. So we're always positioning the healthcare system and each network entity to be able to accept whatever's coming, the, the, whether it be from the government um, or the commercial payers or, you know, a brand new pandemic that happens to, to pop up. And so um, 
Uh, it's a lot of reading. It's reading industry journals. It's uh, looking um, to other organizations. I mean, we do a lot of uh, listservs and collaborate with other facilities, even though they may be competitors. Um, when it comes to taking care of the population, we all do work together. So it, it is a lot of extra reading. So when, when you know, people say, well, what's the you know, new book you're reading? I don't read anything <laughs> that is not industry specific um, for me because there is so much out there and that's been great. You know, with the, the internet, you can get real time information and, and from anywhere around the world and, and stay up to date. So, but it does take, um, you know, blocking the time to do it and making sure because it's very easy to just delete the email or put it in a stack of I'll, I'll get to it eventually and by then you'll be behind. That's great. Does anybody else want to touch on that one? Um, I have a more general one, which is um, what I would suggest is everybody just seek out your weaknesses. So everybody is going to know what you're good at. Um, most people won't tell you what you're weak at. Um, and those weaknesses I found in my career are the things that limit you the most. Um, so I continually seek out weaknesses, whether it's from my investors or my colleagues say, hey, what are the things that uh, you think are limiting me? And then, you know, you take it in and you say, do I believe it or I don't believe it? Even if you don't believe it, there's always a nugget of truth in there. And then you identify that nugget of truth and improve on it. Yeah, I think that's, that definitely makes sense for sure. So um, can you talk about the trade-offs in deep expertise versus a diversity of experience and when you have to choose one over the other? So I think especially with all of you having majored in engineering, sometimes we think of that as being kind of like more deep expertise. And I know, um, Rashida, you made the decision to pivot just based off of who you saw have success. So do you want to get us started with that question? Yeah, sure. I actually like to describe my career as a T-shaped career. So, you know, I've sort of built out depth from a technology standpoint. So I've worked across many different technologies, hardware technology, software technology, you know, doing services, you know, for technology. But then I also wanted to ensure that I had breadth as well. So I led development teams, I led product management teams, I led delivery consulting teams, you know, now I'm leading a large go to market organization. And for me, that was really important because I always had a passion for technology. And I wanted to make sure that I was not just pigeonholed to one technology. I wasn't just the the hardware gal or the software gal. I wanted to know different technologies and have an understanding of how those technologies manifest for different client environments. And then I also wanted to understand what it was like to build the actual product, how to actually market the product, you know, what customers are actually saying about the product, because I think that gives you a different lens and perspective. So, you know, while I may be in a sales role now, my experience in terms of actually building the technology, you know, I can have a different level and more cross-functional conversation with a client because I have that background. So I was very intentional and I think industrial engineering taught me that, that breadth is so important. Yes, you need to have depth of expertise, um, but especially as you pursue and, you know, want to advance in leadership capabilities, you know, having that breadth of experiences makes you uber competitive. Yeah, I like the description of the, the T-shape. Does anybody else want to comment on that one? Well, if I may, I'd like to jump in and agree wholeheartedly yeah. with Rashida, especially given that we're IE colleagues. But I see the, the depth versus diversity being very much an evolution. I think at some later point in your career, since I won't claim that I'm in my 20s, but at some later point in your career, if you'd like to have a very strong influence in your background, necessarily has to be very diverse. But early on in your career, I think you have to demonstrate very deep expertise in one or more disciplines and areas of focus. But I think it's important to understand that unless that's what you want to do for the rest of your life, you build upon that. And it's an evolution from a couple really deep things to much more broader and diverse things. Yeah, I think Tony is exactly right. Like, if your goal is to become an amazing engineer, then you go for depth. If you want to broaden out to business, then you need breadth. 
Yeah, I agree. And actually, I, I want to follow up on that, too, just because we did have a question that was, is it necessary to have an MBA degree to become an executive? So you kind of just mentioned that if you want to kind of dive into more of engineering versus the breadth of it. So if you don't need an MBA degree, uh, how do you equip yourself with the business management knowledge? So I just thought that was a really good segue, Eric. Oh, uh, you absolutely do not need an MBA. Uh, if anything, oh, this is going to be crazy, but I think an MBA sort of holds you back because it, it makes you think that the answer is in a book. Um, really, business is really about understanding people and how uh, people behave under different situations. So stressful situations, um, you know, how do they uh, handle that? How do they break? So it's really focusing your energy on understanding people and how organizations behave under different situations. Yeah, I agree with what Eric said. I mean, remember when I mentioned in the beginning that, you know, this rotational program, IBM was targeting initially MBAs and I didn't have one, you know, but I said, I can do this. I have shown that I have the expertise in this area to be successful you know, which to Tony's point allowed me to build a credence and credibility because I was known for something. I was known for that expertise. I think that's critical. I mean, I went back to school to get my MBA and certainly I would do it all over again, but I don't feel that my career would not have progressed if I did not um, get my MBA. Quite frankly, one of the biggest values that, you know, I think I got from my MBA experience was actually learning from other people and the vast amount of experiences from the others that were in my class. So back to Eric's point, it's around learning how other people think. You know, I had purple hearts and doctors and lawyers and accountants, you know, people that I didn't naturally interface with in my role. So it gave me a lens and a perspective of how they made decisions and, you know, how to influence, you know, people with, you know, that, that level, that, those different capacities. Yeah, I uh, want to just jump in and say I don't have an MBA, um, and, and my master's was in, in an engineering discipline, but I would say that 95% of the chief medical officers do have an MBA, and now it may just be a prerequisite to get to an interview phase if you are going to be applying for a job unless you already have a decade of experience. So um, you, you have to look at that of, of you know, how, are, how is your CV or resume going to be screened? Um, you know, my answer when they ask, well, you know, how did you learn all this if you don't have an MBA? Well, when you're a managing partner in a, a medical practice and you are making, you run the front office, you run the back, you have to know it all and you're playing with your money, not somebody else's money. It's pretty easy to go ahead and make decisions when it's not your livelihood. But you know, the three of us that were partners, everything else got paid before we got paid. And uh, you know, we had three offices. We had you know maybe fifty to seventy-five employees. Um, and so it's not a huge business, but it was our business, and we were the ones that were financially accountable. So real life experience um, in saying, yeah, I, I can do this. I don't have the MBA. I have the MS, but um, yeah, I think you can sell yourself without it, but it may be the, the rate limiting step that gets your, your CV to, to the interview phase. Yeah. I want to jump in and agree with everything that was said that I do think it can help in interview phase, but I see limited utility, at least in, in my industry afterwards. In fact, I'll never forget um, a relatively young engineer was lobbying me for a promotion and said, well, Tony, you may not know this, but I have an MBA. And I go, that speaks volumes. The fact that I didn't know it and it wasn't noticeable to me, tells you what you need to know. And then secondly, you'll notice when we introduce one another, I don't even introduce myself as having an MBA because it's not from NC State, and so therefore it's not important. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Um, I just want to answer one quick question, and then we're going to sign off because I know we have to end at one. But we did have one question come through that there is a high school senior who is interested in majoring in engineering at NC State. So what advice would you give? So if anybody wants to take that one, and we'll wrap up. Do it. <laughs> What's the price to pay off? <laughs> There's no question. Just sign up. 
There you go. I think that's a, that's a good note to end on. So um, we do want to be respectful of everyone's time. So uh, we are upon the hour. Thank you so much to each of our wonderful speakers for sharing your stories and advice with us today. I know I learned a lot and really enjoyed hearing your insight. Um, and thank you all for tuning in and watching today. If you enjoyed today, which we hope you did, please join us next week uh, for the next Leaders of the PAC Speaker Series event on Wednesday, October 21st, where you hear from graduates from the College of Communities and Social Sciences. So thanks again for joining. Have a wonderful rest of the day and stay safe. Good, everybody. <laughs> See you. Thanks. See you.